And what's happening now is that we have so many cable channels, hundreds and hundreds of them, and we also have cable modem internet access, all traveling on this old, this old copper wiring. What's happening is we've pretty much almost reached the bandwidth of this cable's capabilities. And so what's happening now is fiber. we're starting to get fiber backbones and fiber infrastructures. And so the cable companies and Verizon and a few others are replacing all of this old coax cabling with fiber optic cabling. Instead of the signal being passed along the copper in like a pulse format, in, in, a, in, a, in an analog format, you have pulses of light traveling along your fiber optic. Because the speed of light is so fast, we have essentially almost an unlimited amount of capacity and speed on a fiber line. We went to Verizon's headquarters to find out about their plan to install fiber optic service throughout the city. Did you ever think that you'd be able to go onto YouTube this morning and catch the late baseball games from last night and see the, the highlights and whatnot? No, you didn't. Well, think now in 2008, what are the possibilities that could come forward in the year 2015 and through 2020? We can't think of them, but what we want to have is a network that's able to handle those things. Fios is, is uh, fiber to your home, and it shouldn't be confused with fiber to the node or fiber to the curb. We're actually bringing the, um, the fiber I mentioned from the central office directly to your home. This gets it again into these issues of control because Verizon is rolling out fiber, but they, before they did, they went to the FCC and because they're, they have a very powerful lobby, they got the rules changed to benefit them again and say, oh, this new fiber, even though we're based on these millions of customers we have from the old telephone system, we don't have to share this new fiber we roll out. They are under no obligation that they have to service everybody. They get to roll it out how they want, when they want, to whom they want. They get to charge what they want. They don't have to share it. It is a private network. We didn't let General Motors build and operate the U.S. highway system. The U.S. highway system benefited GM, just like it benefited Exxon and, and a lot of other but anybody doing deliveries, it was there for the public. We have lost the sense of, of what should be held in common. We are creating an infrastructure, um, and it's very key to, to keep that in mind, of fiber. We're building a network that's supposed to last for another 100 years. So you hear a lot of uh, things like 3D TV and things of that nature, which nowadays really doesn't seem that far off. Well, guess what? Some of the other competitors won't be able to go into those markets without upgrading their infrastructure, but by then it'll be too late. Verizon will already be there. You know, for the most part, the way that the government is set up, it's to treat that as private property. So it's Verizon's private property, uh, you know, just like if they have a, you know, they own a building, they get to decide, you know, how to arrange the furniture in the building. That's sort of Verizon's approach to it. But the fact is that when you're talking about a platform that everybody uses, that we share for something as important as, as speech, then that, I think, gets into a different category as far as our concerns about the wires that Verizon owns. Some things are almost like state functions. The idea of providing a general purpose communications network, like the idea of providing railroads, seems like something that a sovereign might do. And so it has to be equal and open to everyone. Common carriage is the very simple idea that someone providing essential transport or communications should not be permitted to pick winners and losers among the communications or the bales of hay that it carries. That's the notion, and it was really tied to providers of uh, infrastructure. That infrastructure is so important to society uh, that we should make sure that it's open to all uh, at a fair price without discrimination according to the content of what's being carried. It's the way that telephone companies were required to act with respect to the communications they carry. The internet basically grew within the phone environment. The infrastructure was just the infrastructure and sending data over the phone lines you know, was basically looked at similarly to sending your voice over phone lines. At some point, basically the cable companies, you know, which were providing internet service, went to the FCC and said, hey look, you know, why does our internet service 
regulated like it's going over phone lines when it's going over our cable lines. So Brand X versus FCC is, it, is this major landmark case in the summer of 2005 where the cable industry succeeds in persuading the courts that they should not be treated like plain old telephone service providers, that they should be able to be as private as the deli on the corner and not required to be, to be non-discriminatory, not required to open up their facilities to ISPs. It's that case where cable gets that treatment. And then five days later, the telephone companies ask for the same treatment for their DSL lines. We've gotten to the situation where our basic transport mechanism is discriminatory, like, you know, some, a dinner party. And we're not used to having communications treated that way.